Joining us now, Rory Johnson. He's an energy analyst and he's the writer over at Commodity Context on Substack. I hope you guys go ahead and subscribe. We'll have a link down there in the description. Welcome back to the show, Rory. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me back on. Of course, man. Okay, so there's wild swings going on in oil. First it's down, then people are saying it could hit 65 a barrel, as you were telling me right before you came on. Now the uh, price has gone up. What is going on with oil, Rory? Why is it? Why are there all these crazy swings? Is it Wall Street? Is it supply? Break it down for us. Yeah, so I think, you know, so just to put in context for people that don't follow the market on a regular basis, uh, the last month has been pretty terrible for crude oil. Uh, it was as high on a WTI basis in early June. It's 120 bucks. Then it fell kind of a couple different times. And then two days ago on Tuesday, it just completely collapsed. Uh, the third largest daily decline in the market's history. Um, so we're in this extreme volatility moment. I think there's this open question as you know, what's causing it? And I think it's a couple things, but primarily the market is, you know, volatile because the fundamentals, frankly, and our understanding and outlook for the fundamentals are very, very volatile. Uh, we're jumping between these kind of extremely, you know, oversupplied moments in the early in early pandemic to we've been in this chronic undersupply environment for about the past 18 months or so, uh, and inventories have come down at, at a record fast pace. So we're in a kind of a precarious environment overall, but that's, that's you know, within the backdrop of this, you know, overall recessionary risk. And at the end of the day, well, oil is fundamentally a physical commodity that, you know, you and I put in our, put in our planes and yes. our, and our kind of cars and everything else. Um, you know, it is also a financial asset. And what we're seeing right now is a lot of different actors trying to express those views, those macro views through oil. And, I, you know, oil is getting kind of tossed around the process with the, with along, you know, with the rest of the market. Yeah. So speak to that a little bit more, because I think there's a layman's understanding out there that, you know, the price of a barrel of oil, it's the supply and the demand and where the two curves mm -hmm. meet. That's what it is. But Obviously, that doesn't make sense when you have these wild swings. Like, the fundamentals can't shift minute to minute, and the basics of supply and demand can't shift like that minute to minute. So how much of these swings have to do with financial speculation? Break that down for us a little bit, and also tell us whether— you know, whether you think that it's a healthy thing for the market of this commodity <laughs> that we all really depend on, that it's uh, it goes through these wild slings, swings based on that speculation. Okay, so I'm going I'm to break this down into two different sections here, because I think, you know, on the one hand, we're certainly seeing what I'm going to call a flush out of speculative positions. You know, crude doesn't move more than $10 a barrel a day without some kind of, you know, financial market positioning at play and people getting washed to those positions. So that's definitely we have seen that and particularly on the downsides. Um, as people kind of, you know, they're holding a crude position, you know, futures contracts or options down the curve. Uh, and for whatever reason, you know, prices come down too quickly or this kind, there's this kind of broader recessionary macro fear. Prices drop and then people all bail en masse. So that is happening. But at the same time, what's really interesting and what's what's been uh, occurring since Russia's invasion of Ukraine, when prices have been extraordinarily volatile, we've been trapped in this extremely high uh, volatility regime. Um, we've actually seen speculative interest in crude fall through that entire period. So we huh. actually have less speculators in the market than we normally do. But what I think is, and you were saying, you know, fundamentals don't change that quickly. And I agree on a minute to minute basis. And, you know, Tuesday's price action was obviously crazy and obviously kind of some kind of speculative flush out. But mm -hmm. I do think over the past, you know, three months since Russia invaded Ukraine, we have honestly been experiencing you know, unprecedented changes day to day, headline to headline even, in our expectations of fundamentals. So mm. I do think to a degree that some of the volatility has been fundamentally justified. Unfortunately, you know, we go between, you know, Ru you know Russia's going to lose 3 million barrels a day of supply, according to the EIA. And then, you know, later that day or later that week, you know, China locks down, you know, 60% of its economy. So we're seeing, you know, bit, you know normally, uh, you know, I've been in the industry about a decade, most of my time in the industry, we're talking about half a million barrels a day here, maybe a million barrels a day there. These are the kind of numbers we're talking about. This is kind of amplified by three or four fold, uh, you know, now. And each kind of change in a headline can mean a huge change to, you know, your global supply demand balance. So I think we are in this extremely high volatility fundamental regime, but you know, as we're seeing, even if there isn't that much speculation, those speculators that do remain in the market 
can have, you know, weak hands in moments like this when there are so many fears of recession and people right. just dump their positions and kind of walk away, particularly for many of these uh, many of these funds that are involved. You know, it has actually been a relatively profitable trade. So they're taking money <laughs> off the table. OK, so Roy, uh, in general, let's look forward. What are some of the things people should look to that are going to affect not just the price of oil, but the price at the pump? What are some major events? I know EIA you guys are looking at um, supply issues. Are there any major announcements or other policy maneuvers that could affect the global price? What do you think of that? Yeah, so I think, you know, breaking it again into two pieces. So we've had this crude oil crisis and we've also had this refining crisis. And we've talked about this a lot. And the idea is, you know, there aren't enough refineries anymore. Uh, COVID kind of uh, uh, spiked retirements in old refineries and delayed the coming online of new refineries. So the crack spread or the refinery margin that you're paying at, you know, at the pump is normally for a barrel of gas, you know, for a, you know, a barrel of gasoline, somewhere like 15, $20 a barrel. It's been trading over $60 a barrel. So the first thing we hope to see over the course of this year is a normalization of those crack spreads and refining margins as more refineries come online that had been delayed by COVID. So that's the first thing. I think that is mostly going to be a good positive story for consumers at the pump kind of over the coming six months. Even, you know, over the last two days, we've already seen crack spreads come in about 25% from their highs, which is a fantastic news, both for consumers and for the Federal Reserve, which has been watching pump prices much more than usual because of this fear of an unanchoring of, uh, you know, an unmooring of inflation expectations. But I do fear that the crude oil crisis is going to become worse again over time. And the reason for that is that you know, by the end of the summer, OPEC is going to have uh, you know, returned all of the barrels it had planned to return. Uh, this is barrels that had still been held off the market from the initial early 2020 kind of emergency action that OPEC, OPEC took to kind of save the oil market. Um, so that's going to be coming to an end. Uh, the SPR, which has been, you know, been pumping between a million and a million and a half barrels a day, depending on how you count it, um, over the past couple, you know, month or two, and is expected to do that for the rest of the summer. That will also come to an end. So that's that kind of the equivalent of of a you know a small or even medium sized OPEC producer kind of falling out of the supply balance again. Um, and then you know, and then all that together. And I think that you know we're still going to get demand that's going to continue to accelerate again, absent some kind of truly deleterious recession or or, or worse. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think, going to be particularly pronounced in China, where, you know, most of this year, the beginning of the year, we actually have seen reasonably weak global supply demand balances because of these lockdown in China. Um, and, you know, crude oil inventories globally have kind of stayed still for a couple months after falling at their fastest pace on record. My mm -hmm. expectation is, as that demand normalizes from, you know, a, you know, a rollback of, uh, you know, these uh, kind of curtailment policies, but also as some of that supply starts to fall off, I think the crude oil balances are going to start tightening again. I think that's where you're going to see the action going forward as kind of refining kind of, uh, you, know, sol you know, sorts itself out and kind of moves to the background. Got it. So bottom line, what do you think is going to happen with gas prices? <laughs> In the near term, I think they're going to fall. And I think that's going to be a very, very positive thing going into driving season here. I think recessionary fears are still high. Uh, obviously, crude oil is much lower than it has been and, and crack spreads as well. So I do think that there is some kind of relief in, you know, over the next month or two for consumers at the pump. But then I think that things are going to, you know, take a turn for the worse again in the fall. And I think, be, you know, prices are going to begin rising again uh, until we get more, particularly U.S. supply growth. And I think that will be the main, that'll be the only real kind of organic thing that's going to be able to bring the prices, crude prices down in any reasonable manner. Got it. Gotcha. Well, we can always count on you to actually break it down for us. I, I, as you know, I, I hit this guy up like every day being like, what is going on? <laughs> I appreciate you telling the audience as well. Uh, like we said, Commodity Context, Substack, it'll be down there in the description and we appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. Thank you guys so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Uh, we're really glad that Crystal is back. Reminder, we're coming on the live tour. We're supposed to do it at the top, but whatever. Put it up. Put the we're graphic too, we on the too, screen. We were too, you know, thinking about yes. Boris Johnson. That's right. We were too busy so. thinking about Boris. <laughs> September 16th, Atlanta. We're coming. Apparently, we sold a lot of tickets. Let's just sell this thing out completely so we can show the industry that that's what we do over here. We're negotiating already with different venues across the country, and so the tour will continue. But if you're in the Atlanta or greater Atlanta slash Florida, et cetera, northern Florida, Alabama, mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. of that. And you want to come see us, we would mean the world. We're going to have a great show for all of you guys. It's something that we're going to record and we're really planning about different ways that we can make it really fun, engaging, and I think it's going to be a good time. So let's sell this thing out and then we'll take the tour across the country and it'll be a lot of fun for us. I actually, had a, I actually had a dream about this last night. There you go. I had a dream about yeah. the show. Yeah. But it was one of those like yeah. stressful, almost like high school dreams mm. where it was like, we're about to do the show and we weren't prepared oh, and I was like, oh my God, what are we going to do? Well, that's not going to happen. That's so not going to happen. We don't do we'll that be over. ready for you. Yes, we'll be very, very ready for you. <laughs> have a great weekend, guys. Um, we're going to have good partner content and all that over the weekend and uh, we'll see you all later. Cable news is ripping us apart, dividing the country, making it impossible to function as a society, and making it impossible to know just what is true and what is false. But the good news is they are failing and they know it. That is why we're building something new, a new mainstream, a healthier one, something more trustworthy, something that we are going to need in one of the most pivotal times in American history. We are building up here for the midterms, for the upcoming presidential election, but we need your help. So if you can help us out by becoming a premium member today at breakingpoints.com, we're trying to change America for the better and the entire world. So what are you waiting for, guys? Go to breakingpoints.com and sign up and help us build a new mainstream.